So in the interest of time, I'm going to be dividing up the rational functions video into two parts. The first part is going to talk about the feeling functions, extroverted feeling versus introverted feeling. And the second part is going to talk about extroverted thinking and introverted thinking, the thinking functions. Um, first thing to note is that the, this first one is uh, the feeling functions and it's coming out tonight, obviously, and then hopefully the thinking functions will come out uh, sometime tomorrow. It won't take me much longer to finish it off, but I, I only had time to do this one, and also because it's one of the longest scripts that I've written out, and I knew it would be very, very long, and figured it'd just be nicer to, to make them a little bit easier, more manageable chunks. So tonight I'm going to talk about the feeling functions. Also, you'll notice that I'm not talking about them as conjoined axes. The reason I'm doing this is not because I'm beginning to endorse a non-Heracletian model of the function axes, but because just by studying the two poles separately of Fe and Fi, I think it helps better represent their own axes. Without further ado, extroverted feeling versus introverted feeling. Continuing from my definitions of extroversion and introversion in the previous video and defining feeling as forming conclusions or judgments about a thing's value as opposed to the mere functionality or attributes of the thing, we can define extroverted feeling then as, quote, forming judgments about a thing's objective value in the world, and introverted feeling as forming judgments about a thing's subjective value to the individual. This is why extroverted feeling is often considered accommodating because it's chiefly concerned with the value that other people attach to things while introverted feeling is often considered individualistic because it is chiefly concerned with the value that it personally attaches to things, despite what other people attach to it. Another way of looking at it was given by Young, and which I have rewritten in simpler language, quote, the extrovert never expects anything absolute or reliable to come from her inner life because the only absolutes she pays attention to are outside herself. Her entire consciousness looks outwards to the world because for her, this is where the important and decisive factors always come, although this is only because the extrovert expects them to come from there. And that, that's my own paraphrasing of Jung from Psychological Types. And this principle, however, carries over to the introvert as well, where we might say, quote, the introvert never expects anything absolute or reliable to come from the outside world because the only absolutes he pays attention to are from within him. Ralph Waldo Emerson stated this difference very well himself from his perspective as an introverted feeler, saying, on my saying, what have I to do with the sacredness of traditions if I live wholly from within, my friend suggested but these impulses may be from below, not from above. I replied, they do not seem to me to be such, but if I am the devil's child, I will live then from the devil. Now, in the case of extroverted feeling, we could say that it does not trust its inner impulses when judging a thing's value, always asking, what if my own impulses are wrong? For it, if a feeling or value arises in the individual, then that's great and all, but it has no bearing whatever on the real world and doing stuff in the real world. There is no guarantee of its validity or use if only one individual feels it, even if that individual is the subject itself. In questions of value, extroverted feeling wants to be objective and not let its own personal biases creep in, because such biases only represent the feelings of one person rather than that of the many, which is what it is concerned with. You can probably see where many philosophical outlooks start relating here. The idea of sacrificing the needs of the one for the needs of the many, such as in Plato's Republic, or the general approach of analyzing the values, feelings, needs, and desires of many individuals in an objective way, such as the work of Carl Jung, or in the social analyses of Mary Wollstonecraft and Simone de Beauvoir. The focus for extroverted feeling is always outwards, towards other people and other objects. Concessions are always made for the sake of the many, rather than that of the few. Thus, there is also a natural belief that, in one way or another, all people are created equal, such as in the ideology of John Locke and his admirer Thomas Jefferson. Because if the needs of the many are more important than the needs of the few, 
then that would presuppose that all people have equal value and no one individual can possibly have more value within themselves than a group of people unless that individual has the power to help an even larger group of people than the first. Thus, we also see the conceding attitude of extroverted feeling. It is more than happy to compromise its own desires and values for the good of a larger group of people. If two parties are in conflict, extroverted feeling will naturally ask both parties to give up as many of their own personal values or desires as are needed to allow to make them compatible and promote their mutual well-being. For instance, John Paul II's statement that, quote, science can purify religion from error and superstition. Religion can purify science from idolatry and false absolutes. Each can draw the other into a wider world, a world in which both can flourish. So you see, extroverted feeling is always seeking to break down the barriers between two parties. It is always seeking unity. Its solution is always for people to forget their differences and work in harmony. Thus, harmony is ultimately more important than individuality. Expression of individuality must always take second priority to harmony between people. For instance, when Cicero stated, quote, we are not born for ourselves alone, and even, quote, a friend is a second self, unquote. We also find that extroverted feeling sentiments of unity embodied in the life, work, and philosophies of Martin Luther King Jr. and Nelson Mandela in their efforts to promote unity and break down barriers between people. Another fascinating example is from one of my favorite philosophers, Ludwig Wittgenstein, whose project with language and concern with, quote, language games was in great part to break down the barriers between people formed by unintentional dishonesty and meaningless statements because what he wanted was so that people could truly be honest with each other and really begin to unite with each other in that respect. Now, in complete contrast to this is the attitude of introverted feeling. It does not trust any criteria for judging a thing's value except it come from the subject itself. Thus, someone else's values are of no interest to it. Other people's values and demands only cloud its own judgment of what is truly valuable. The motion is clearly towards the subject and away from objects and other people. Introverted feeling sees everyone as very much their own person, and therefore everyone should choose to value things because they want to value them, because they want to do them, and never because most other people value them, or because they're considered objectively valuable, or because they're told that they should value them. Thus, introverted feeling is very individualist and iconoclastic even, rather than accommodating and uniting. Once again, we begin to see some clear philosophical attitudes arising directly from introverted feeling. The writings of Emerson and Thoreau are essentially textbooks on this process. Also, a useful comparison is between Sartre, preferring introverted feeling, and de Beauvoir, preferring extroverted feeling. For while de Beauvoir focused on how existentialism applies to the social construct of woman as other and how that affects society as a whole, Sartre focused on how existentialism affects the individual and how an individual is both entirely and horrifyingly free, no matter their circumstances, and furthermore, that each person is born into their own unique circumstances of wealth, position, and culture and through their own choices creates their own life, meaning separate from others. We find similar sentiments in Heidegger, who advocated living authentically by not letting others define who you are. Another great example is the philosophy of Nietzsche, whose fundamental idea of the Ubermesh denies that every human being has equal and disputable value, but instead believes not only that exceptionally creative individuals are more worthy of life, and that such individuals should not be bound down by moral systems lower than themselves, but he champions a whole meritocracy run by competition and conflict and structured as a hierarchy of moral systems. He despised the idea that all people are created equal because he claimed it was an excuse for widespread mediocrity. For rather than buoying up humanity to higher ground as it claimed to do, he felt it instead dragged everyone down to the least common denominator, expecting everyone to conform to the same values, disregarding differences between people or even superiorities between individuals. 
In all these cases, there is a definite sense of individualism. Here, one might say that the one is greater than the many, or at least has the potential to be greater than the many. One person ought to be allowed to break those social rules that do not fit their personal values. Introverted feeling wants to be its own person, to affirm its own values, and not just go along with what other people say. Introverted feeling wants to have its own style, and not just one crafted to please other people. To put all of that in a nutshell then, introverted feeling feels that individuality is ultimately more important than unity or harmony. This idea is encapsulated in the political theory of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and as I understand it, most theories of anarchism as well. While extroverted feeling desires a unified, many-over-one community, such as Plato's Republic, introverted feeling believes, as Henry David Thoreau put it, quote, that government is best that governs not at all, unquote. Although some individuals, such as Thomas Hobbes, may still advocate strict governments, the principle here is not political theory, but the process of introverted feeling desiring to champion its own personal values in the face of regular ones, feeling that everyone is very much their own person when it comes to values, whether one believes uh, people are generally evil-willed, as Hobbes suggests, or believes that they're generally good-willed, as Rousseau assumes. It is also worth noting that Hobbes prefers extroverted thinking over introverted feeling in the middle of his stack, so while the individualism is there, in this case his extroverted thinking, I think, also manifested a focus on objective structure to personal expression. Unlike Rousseau, who represses such objective structure in favor of complete personal freedom. But either way, introverted feeling wants its own isolated bubble, if you will to try to speak to other people's inner feelings in objective, nearly scientific terms, as extroverted feeling sometimes does, is not only foolhardy, but even insulting. So, to summarize all of that, I think the best way to put it is extroverted feelings motto is, quote, we are Groot, while introverted feelings motto seems to be, follow your heart. In even shorter terms, it is harmony versus individualism. So that's what I have for feeling, extroverted thinking and extroverted, uh, excuse me, extroverted thinking and introverted thinking will be coming up hopefully tomorrow, um, not too late in the day. I just need to finish up a few more things with it. But thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.